now I wish you all a warm welcome to this event. My name is Mariana Glavica. I come from Croatian Social Science uh, Data Archive. And uh, this uh, event uh, is uh, initiated and supported and also facilitated by SESDA ERIC, which is a consortium of social science data archives. Uh, I'm now showing you the SESDA web page. And as you can see, uh, SESDA is, uh, uh, is a, is a pan-European uh, research infrastructures. It provides large scale integrated and sustainable data services to the social sciences. It brings together social science data archives across Europe with the aim of promoting the results of social science research and supporting national and international research and cooperation. Uh, CESDA uh, consists of uh, members and partners. Uh, so we currently have uh, 22 uh, member countries, one is on preserver and also 12, uh, 12 partners. So this is a CESDA webpage and you can find more information about uh, CESDA there. Is, it's on the address CESDA EU, it's very simple. Um, so this event, is organized by Croatian Social Science Data Archive Krosta in collaboration with uh, Danish National Archive DNA. Uh, and the topic of this event uh, is anonymization, as this is one of the most important techniques which should be utilized to reduce the risk of free identification and possible harm resulting from sharing data about people. In the first part of this uh, event, our colleague Jan Dalsen Sorensen from Danish National Archives will guide you through the anonymization process that takes place in their archive. Uh, this will be interesting for other colleagues who are working in data archives all around Europe, maybe uh, even broader, uh, and uh, they will be able to compare their own processes with uh, what is done in DNA. And if you are a researcher, because we invited to this event also researchers, uh, this will hopefully encourage you to share your data uh, because you will see inside processes which are going on in data archives and how we are taking care of personal uh, and sensitive data. For the second part of this uh, event, Vedran Halamic from the Croatian Social Science Data Archive uh, will then continue uh, by explaining uh, basic concepts of anonymization. So he will be, give you a, a bit, bit of theory around that. And for the last part, uh, we have prepared a hands-on experience uh, with uh, one of the programs that you can use when doing uh, anonymization. Uh, the program is called SDC uh, Micro. Uh, and Vedran will provide you with uh, one example data set uh, and also some exercises that you can, uh, you can follow. Uh, as, this is, uh, as the format of this event is a train the trainer, uh, all materials from this workshop uh, will be shared in open access. Uh, so you can use these materials uh, in your own training, uh, training sessions. So without further uh, ado, I would like to invite uh, Jan to start his presentation. And what I didn't mention that we will also have at least one break. Uh, and of course, there will be time for your questions and answers. Jan, the floor is yours. All right, thank you, Mariana. And I just want to make sure that uh, my presentation is up and running as it should be. It is. All right, that's great. Thank you so much. 
And thank you all for joining us this afternoon here in this Train the Trainer event uh, that is organized by the Croatian <clears throat> Data Archive and us at the Danish National Archives. My name is Jan Dalsen Sørensen, and I'm currently head of data services at the Danish National Archives. Um, I've been at the archives since 1999, and I actually started out as an archivist working with uh, ingest of born digital records. I then moved on to um, digital preservation, where I was head of digital preservation for 14 years. And for the past year and a half, I have been at uh, data services, heading that uh, department, where we work with all sorts of ways to make our data accessible for our users. And with me today, I have my colleague, Mess Teasing Ingholm, who is a senior advisor in uh, data services. He has been with the National Archives since uh, 2009, and he has a background in social sciences. As this is a shared presentation, I will, uh, I will do most of the talking in the first in the presentation, and Mess will be there uh, ready to help me answer any questions that you might uh, have. And I think we've split the presentation so pretty much 50-50 um, in terms of uh, contribution to of the content. So that's why we both uh, are here. And first, a few words about the Danish National Archives. Now, I know this is not to be overly uh, self-centered, but I think it's important that you understand the perspective and the position that we are talking from. Now, we are uh, today here representatives from, I guess, uh, both data archives, universities, research institutions, et cetera, et cetera. And, um, and we have various um, perspectives. Now, for the perspective of the Danish National Archives, you should know that we are the National Archive that covers all state authorities and institutions. We also cover all five regions. The regions are uh, the ones that are primarily uh, responsible for the healthcare in Denmark, uh, university, hospitals, hospitals, uh, and, and that kind of thing. We also are the archive for about half of the municipalities uh, in Denmark, and we are archive for any publicly funded research, for instance, at the universities, and also <clears throat> an archive for private record creators' uh, donations. And that, of course, includes a lot of uh, research that has been done privately, but where the researcher want us to uh, take care of and preserve um, the, the data from their research and to make it accessible to our users. So we are an archive with a very broad collection and many uh, various tasks and the preservation of and uh, dissemination of research data is, is one, uh, of course, important part, but just one part of what we do. So in Denmark, we do not have one uh, specific data archive. It's, um, it's all integrated in the Danish National Archives. The purpose for us, what we do is, of course, to preserve records of historical value and also, and this is specifically, I think, interesting for uh, state agencies, we are also the ones that allow them to dispose of records that do not have historical value, because obviously it would be very difficult to be an institution under the Archives Act if the archives never let you dispose of anything and we can't preserve all information, of course. So that's also an important uh, part. Now, for what we're talking about today is, of course, mostly what we do in terms to make records accessible, accessible to citizens, authorities, etc., including also for research. Um, I can see that there's uh, a comma missing. It should be for citizens, comma, authorities, and including for research, and to guide users in their use of records. And finally, it's also a purpose for the National Archives to perform uh, research, but uh, we will not talk about that uh, research today. So the main focus for today's presentation is what we do to make records accessible. And in this uh, context, anonymization is of course super important because it's one of the tools that we have to make our records accessible that would otherwise have to be uh, protected for data protection uh, purposes. We usually 
talk about the OIS model as sort of the reference of what we're doing. And I don't know if you're all familiar with it, but it's a model that shows the function that are necessary to have a full digital archive. <clears throat> um, and again, what we're talking about today is of course centered on uh, the communication between the archive and the consumer. What we do and when we anonymize is when we have a consumer, a user that want to use some of the data that we have and we communicate with the user regarding how to give, uh, give them a, um, a data set that does not contain any sensible information or sensitive, <laughs> sensitive information, is certainly the right word here. But it's also important to remember that in an archive, the processes should be seen together. And it's also an important point for me today to say that when we talk about how we can make records accessible, including how we can anonymize records so that they can make, uh, be made accessible sooner than they otherwise would uh, be, it's very important to have a good communication with the produ producer of data. And we should really talk about this already at the time of ingest to let the producer describe the data as good as possible so that we eventually will have uh, an easier task in terms of um, making it accessible through anonym anonymization. And then obviously also a lot of processes go on uh, in the preservation part of the archive. And sometimes <clears throat> the work with data in preservation will have implications for the way we can make it accessible for the users. So again, the processes of ingest preservation and dissemination should be seen uh, as a whole. And it's really important for us as an archive that the members of staff that do both ingest preservation and dissemination they talk to each other and they know something about uh, the processes in, in each sort of phase in the archive. Of course, as a national archive, we are governed by the Archives Act uh, and GDPR, the General Data Protection Regulation uh, is of course also a very important part of the legislation that governs our work and there can be some specific access restrictions set by the donor if we are working with uh, data from private records creators. Now, the point of this slide is to say that this is the legislation that I will be speaking uh, on the basis of, but it's really important that you all figure out exactly what legislation governs your work when it comes to anonymization and obviously all other sorts of um, tasks, because this can be really complicated to figure out <clears throat> exactly what rules and regulations there are and how they work together. So what I say today might be specific for a national archive. I'm not even completely sure because uh, I don't know exactly what kind of regulations and legislation you all uh, are working under. But um, I think it's really important that you uh, think about exactly what legislation applies to you, because when we talk about how to handle sensitive personal data, it's really important that we know exactly uh, what kind of legislation that we are using and working with. And now uh, a big disclaimer, I am not going to go into much detail about GDPR because that would be, I think, a session totally uh, on its own. But since we're talking about data with uh, sensitive personal information and how we can make that accessible to our users through the process of anonymization, it's really important that we just take a, at least a glance at the GDPR. Uh, Article 89 of uh, GDPR states that obviously we can work with, um, we can process personal data for archiving purposes in the public interest or for scientific or historical research uh, or for statistical purposes. But of course, even if we do that for historical research, for scientific purposes, for archiving purposes in the public interest, etc., we still need, of course, to take appropriate safeguards to handle personal information 
We need to ensure that technical and organizational measures are in place. We need to look at the principle of data minimization, and that could include pseudo minimization, uh, as stated here in, in section one of Article 89. And in Article 89, it also says <clears throat> that, um, again, where we have this kind of um, processing for historical uh, statistical purposes, we still need to have uh, the safeguards as mentioned in paragraph one. So the conclusion here is that unless you fully anonymize data, that is that you completely destroy the possibility of reversing the anonymization process, you will still have to take uh, GDPR into account. For instance, by ensuring that you have, of course, a legal basis for the processing of personal data and that you have appropriate safeguards in place and appropriate safeguards cover both technical and organizational measures. It's obvious that we can dramatically reduce the risks to the rights and freedoms of the data subjects by anonymizing or pseudonymizing, but it's only full anonymization that will make GDPR inapplicable in this context. And by full anonymization, at least we would think that it is the complete destruction of personal information. In that case, you can leave GDPR out of, uh, out of it, but otherwise you will still have to think about the legal basis for your processing and the appropriate safeguards. Anonymization or pseudonymization, which is probably mostly what we do um, at the National Archives, uh, is one of the measures that we can take to make sure that we don't risk um, leaking or sensitive information that should not have come out of the archive. On the other hand, for us as an archive, a complete full anonymization that leaves no possibility for reversing the process is very difficult to, uh, to imagine because that will mean that we should eventually destroy the information so that it could never be recovered and the business that we're in is really not about destroying information. It's about preserving information for posterity. Now, <clears throat> when we work with um, anonymization or pseudonymization at the National Archives, we primarily work with quantitative data. We have a large collection uh, of data from this wide range of uh, records creators that we talked about earlier. Um, and you could probably divide it into two main categories. The first categories, category is uh, data that has been uh, gathered for the purpose of scientific research. And that is mostly survey data. And our collection is especially strong in the fields of uh, health surveys and surveys from the social sciences. It's not exclusively those uh, types of data, but that's a, a very big part of it. And for a collection of research data, uh, we have about 3000 um, data units or uh, information packages if you speak in OAIS terms. Now, obviously, because health has been such an important focus area for our collection, we have a lot of data that are considered to be really sensitive in the terms of GDPR, because we have lots of data that say something about people's uh, health. And this is, of course, one of the, one of the types of data that uh, is especially sensitive according to GDPR. But also in the data sets from the social sciences, we can find Lots of information that is considered um, sensitive, especially all those surveys where we talk uh, or where people have been asked about their political uh, viewpoints or a combination of political viewpoints and other types of opinions. That kind of surveys will again be super sensitive according to uh, the categories of um, the GDPR. And Obviously, it's really important for us to be very, very cautious 
in terms of what we uh, disseminate and give out to other researchers for reuse. The other main part of our collection consists of data that we have received from <clears throat> the public administration, both state and local level. Um, and that part of our collection is about 6,000 uh, information packages. <clears throat> and in that collection, we have, of, of course, lots of documents, uh, but they will not be covered by this presentation because in this presentation, we will focus on how we handle structured data. Uh, and obviously, even though we get a lot of documents from the public administration, the public administration also has um, gazillions of IT systems with data worth of preserving. So we get um, data from, well, maybe not gazillions, but at least 500, 2000 uh, different IT systems, I think, uh, or maybe even more. In both the, uh, the survey data and the data that we have received from the public administration, we will find a lot of direct identifiers of uh, people. Most people are still alive today because the born digital data that we are talking about here is of course uh, of much more recent uh, date than the paper records that we have in our collection. And even if they don't contain direct identifiers, many of them will contain indirect identifiers. If you would like to have a look at our collection, uh, there is a link here at the bottom of the slide to our catalog for born digital records of both, uh, both the survey data and from the public administration. Um, however, you will need to understand at least some Danish to uh, to find it useful, but please do have a look once you get a chance. Now from this collection, can you even access sensitive data if you want to use any of our data for a research project? Yes, you can if you have the required uh, permission. And how do you get those permissions? Well, first, you have to look at the, uh, the Archives Act. Um, it states that for the first 20 years after data have been submitted to the archives, you can only get permission uh, to use them or access to, uh, to access the data if you get a permission from the data donor. Obviously, it's the National Archives that, that will, will ask the data donor for you, et cetera, but we will have to get uh, consent from the records creator, from the data donor to, uh, to disseminate data for the first 20 years um, after they have been submitted to us. If the data that you want to use uh, is in the category of sensitive data, that is data with um, uh, information about uh, individuals, uh, personal uh, things, then you will have to wait for uh, 75 years or get um, a permission from the Danish Data Protection Agency. Uh, the permission from the Data Protection Agency is also necessary if you want to apply for data that have been uh, that are less than 20 years old, in that and contain personal information. In that case, a permission from the data donor is not enough. You will also have to have the permission from the Danish Data Protection Agency. <clears throat> so we have the collection at the Danish National Archives, but we are not free to disseminate data. Uh, just as we want to. If we want to disseminate data with um, personal information, we have to talk to the Danish Data Protection Agency and to the donor if it's less than 20 years. Obviously, if you want to use personal information, it's not super easy to get access to the full data set. If you really need the full data set and we want to go to the data protection agency, to ask for their permission, then they will look at uh, your project and only grant access for researchers with serious engineering purposes. Um, so this is not a, uh, an assessment that is done by the National Archives. It's an assessment that is done by uh, the Data Protection Agency. But obviously, very often, 
access to the full data set is not even necessary. It may not be necessary to include sensitive data about identifiable persons for the purpose of your research. So this is something that we, of course, um, look very much at when people request data. We can see if, um, if it's possible for them, we can discuss with them, if it's possible to fulfill their research purposes without uh, delivering them the sensitive information. So if we can find a way around that, um, we don't have to include uh, the data protection agency. And of course, this is where anonymization comes into play. Because anonymization is a way for us to balance uh, data security with the analytical value. We realize, of course, that in our collection, we have data sets with enormous value for many sorts of um, research projects. We also realize that those data sets often include information that is sensitive and where it would be absolutely disastrous for us as a national archive if we cannot keep the information closed that should be closed. So for us, anonymization is a way to, uh, to let the researchers have the good stuff from our collection without compromising uh, any indiv individuals. And, and that's why it's a tool in our toolbox that we use a lot uh, to make sure that our collections come into play, that our collections, uh, that the value that is embedded in our collection will actually be released for good projects, but again, so that the individuals will not be compromised. So this is a balance between using our stuff and keeping it closed. So if we go through a process of anonymization, then what do we remove from data? Well, we have some things that we would always remove. We would always remove the civil registration number. We will remove the name, email, phone number, address, and also a possible sequential number. Now, the sequential number may not always make sense because it's just a sequential number. But in many cases, we don't know for sure what this sequential number refers to. And even though we don't know about it, there's, a, there's always a risk that this sequential number refers to something outside of the data set that we have uh, received. And thus, at least in theory, gives the um, the user, the researcher, the possibility to make the information personal identi identifiable again using the sequential number. So we usually remove it. Um, and then sometimes if it's necessary with a sequential number, we can uh, generate uh, one our own, uh, on our own so we can make sure that it does not refer to anything outside. Then we have the indirect identifiers and indirect identifiers are things like job title, the municipality that you live in, date and place of birth, nationality, religion, postal code, education, um, and also free text. And other, other things that we look at on a case to case uh, or case by case basis. Now, the job title uh, is usually absolutely uh, not problematic at all. But we always have to check how detailed is the actual data. Because if the job title says uh, National Archivist or Head of the Royal Library or uh, stuff like that, then you can even in a population of 6 million, as we have in Denmark, you can find um, situations where the job title in itself uh, identifies just one person. Now, obviously, this does not happen very often, <clears throat> but even uh, even in uh, sort of less uh, less unique job titles can give a unique identification of you based on um, the um, the size of the uh, observations. Now, if it's a it's a very small survey for a, um, a small geographic area then obviously your job title might uniquely identify you. So this is one of the things that we will look at 
again, also, of course, looking into the sensitivity of the research uh, issue and the research data. And the more sensitive the issue, of course, the stricter the anonymization or the stricter we are in terms of um, picking out uh, identifiers that we otherwise sometimes would have kept there. <clears throat> and obviously, again, um, the, uh, the GDPR provides a really good uh, sort of guideline for what kind of issues are, are sensitive, some issues about uh, health, uh, disease, sexual orientation, religion, philosoph philosophical um, uh, convictions, et cetera, et cetera. So <clears throat> what we pick out depends on the size of the sample or the size of the population, but also how sensitive the research issue uh, is. And of course, we also have to look at the possibilities for combining indirect identifiers or combining enough indirect identifiers to finally create a unique identification of one individual. We also look at how old data is, and at least a rule of thumb is that the, the newer the data, the stricter the anonymization, obviously because chances of people, <clears throat> chances of the indirect identifiers still being able to identify a, an, a, an individual will uh, increase the newer the data is. You might wonder about uh, the free text or the string uh, fields that we sometimes remove. But that's based on uh, an experience that whenever you have a string field with free text, <clears throat> people can write almost anything. And of course, it varies depending on what the actual IT system did or what the survey was. Um, but in many cases, you will be surprised to see what kind of information you can find in a free text field. Now, when we hand out anonymized data, uh, it's very often for quantitative uh, studies. And in that case, the information uh, in the string fields, the free text fields is usually not uh, useful. And by removing them, we uh, do not risk the, to just uh, disseminate information that should have been, uh, been kept um, secret. We don't, in surveys and other research data, remove non-identifying variables. Uh, so this is the process that we, uh, we take, take away the direct identifiers, look at the indirect identifiers, and assess which ones we need to remove in order to create a data set that has been um, adequately anonymized, or at least pseudonymized. We have an example here with um, <clears throat> gender, age, and region uh, that we usually don't take away. But we had a, um, a survey about politicians in the five regions. And we took some of those uh, identifiers out of the data set because we don't have that many regional politicians in Denmark. And in this case, we only had 123 uh, res people responding to the survey. So in a population this small, you might certainly be able to, um, to identify a politician from uh, the capital region with a unusual combination of gender and, um, and age or uh, something like that, at least enough that you could go to the uh, to the web page of the capital region and see, well, who are the, I don't know, 40 politicians uh, and, and you could see the birth date there. So in this case, because it was such a small population, <clears throat> uh, you, uh, we had to take away some of the identifiers that we would usually just have kept there. Now, <clears throat> we could, of course, also have said that it's not super sensitive to have a data set where you can see what uh, individual politicians uh, thinks because their job is after all 
to think and believe and convince other people to follow what they think and uh, believe. <clears throat> and, and also, of course, the more identifiers you take out of a data set, uh, you always get some loss of analytical uh, value. But in a situation like this, where you have to balance uh, these things, we will always be uh, inclined to choose the more cautious way. So in this case, we took out identifiers that we would otherwise have, uh, have kept. I also added on this little map of uh, Denmark, I, uh, I just, just to show you that we have two uh, the munip new municipalities that we have in Denmark, the, the largest one in terms of inhabitants is uh, Copenhagen, the city of Copenhagen, about 600,000 inhabitants. And the smallest one is a little island called Lesser with 1,800 inhabitants. And obviously, it's very um, uh, different from Lesser to Copenhagen with regards to what type of identifiers uh, that could identify you as uh, an individual. Because if you're one among 600,000 in Copenhagen, that's one situation. If you're one among uh, 1,800 inhabitants in Lesley, now that's a different uh, situation. So the, the actual process is that we do anonymization on demand. So this is a process that we start when a researcher <clears throat> will order uh, a data set. But also, increasingly, when we have data sets that we would like to make available for download. Um, when a researcher has found a data set that they would like to use from our collection and, and contacts us, we, of course, have a look at, uh, at it to see if it does contain any personal information, because if not, we can uh, disseminate it without the uh, approval of the data protection agency, but of course, with the approval of the donor, if it's less than 20 years uh, old. Um, so that's where the process starts. Somebody out there would like to use some data from our collection. However, we also often know that some of our data sets are so popular that it would be uh, better for everyone if they could be available for download. Um, and if we put out data sets for download, then of course we initiate the anonymization process ourselves to make sure that whatever we disseminate on our webpage will uh, certainly be uh, without any information that could compromise uh, identifiable persons. This is currently a fairly manual process. Um, we have not found a business case or a tool that can use it. So no business case for uh, applying tools, because even though we have a large collection, <clears throat> the number of uh, processes where we have to anonymize may not be, uh, it's not that big uh, at the moment. So what we do is then that we have a double screening of the data by two archivists. Um, we would like to make sure that we can minimize the risk of errors and also uh, oops, that we can um, that we can also identify edge cases. And as you saw from the slide with what we take out and what we don't take out, <clears throat> uh, we need to take into account that there's some judgment involved to this is not always a, a very easy task where you just look at data, look at metadata and say, well, this has to go and this has to stay. Sometimes you need to actually discuss this and sort of um, try your judgment uh, against uh, a colleague and see if you agree on whether this is a sensitive issue or not and whether um, a specific type of information should be removed or not. And then, of course, uh, once two people have looked at it, uh, we then produce a separate anonymized version of the data for dissemination. We keep the original data intact, of course, as I said at the beginning. And this is also why we, at least in strict GDPR terms, cannot call what we do uh, complete anonymization, because we do not 
reverse, uh, we do not take away the possibility to get the full data set with the identifiable, uh, personal identifi identifiable information um, back. We also of, most often would keep uh, a copy of the data set that we have disseminated because uh, very often we see that other researchers would be interested in using the same data set. And it's quite practical for us then to have an anonymized version of the data uh, ready. So if we look at a survey here with some, uh, in this case, we have nine variables. The first archivist would say that variable two, five, and seven are sensitive. Then we have a second uh, archivist that agrees on variable two and five, disagrees on variable seven, but then wants to add variable uh, three. And then they uh, agree on this. Uh, and then uh, the first archivist will be the one that actually produces and disseminate the as an anonymized data set. Now, this is, of course, just an example. And I'm not sure exactly how often it is that they would uh, disagree uh, that much uh, in reality. But the process is designed to make sure that just because this is so much a matter of judgment, then we have the discussion between two uh, experienced archivists uh, that have seen a lot of research data um, before we produce an anonymized data set and disseminate it um, to the researcher that wanted to use it. Now, for the part of the collection that stems from uh, the administrative data, data from state authorities, uh, regions and municipalities, etc. They are a little bit different. They are not collected for scientific uh, purposes and they are often a lot more complex uh, than the research data that we have. But even if the administrative data have not been collected for scientific purposes, it's very important for us to stress that that kind of data also has really great potential for scientific use. Uh, one example could be the conscription examination database. Um, we all, at least all young men, I think maybe now uh, both men and women go um, to uh, a conscription examination when we're, I don't know, 18, 19 years old. Um, and and the, the purpose of this uh, database is of course to store information uh, that was necessary for this particular administrative task to figure out uh, which people are suitable for military duty and who are, are then actually drafted for military duty. But for researchers, this database also contains information about the height of people, the weight of people, um, possibly some other health data. It includes the result of the IQ test. So a database that serves a purely administrative purpose will also be, could be really useful for um, research projects uh, with regards to health, et cetera. Um, and the same thing could be said about something like the municipal care systems. They are systems <clears throat> that they use in the municipalities uh, about care for the elderly. And it's mostly just to keep track of what people do, what kind of help they get. But again, for a researcher, some of this information would be super relevant for a health uh, uh, project. And even in our paper records, we can find data that could be uh, formed the basis of really interesting um, research projects. We are currently uh, starting a project about old ship locks uh, where uh, the captain was since 1675 obliged to record every day where the ship was and what the weather was like. And when we have digitized those paper records, we will use uh, hand text recognition to create data sets that will tell us where Danish ships were at a given time and what the climate was on each day they were out sailing. And obviously this information 
will greatly improve the climate um, change models that they have at the, the meteorological institutions. So just to say that we have a collection where you can create a lot of data sets. Obviously, the climate data set <clears throat> is not sensitive in, in any way, but we have many paper records that could create data sets that would be sensitive. When working with administrative data, of course, the main principle is, again, data minimization. We will only give uh, the user the information that they need. And very often, if they ask for, say, the conscription examination database, what they're really asking for is, I want these variables, height, height weight, and IQ for a given population. So that's uh, a different approach uh, compared to the uh, scientific data. And I'll come back to that um, later. I have a, another example of administrative data um, where we have something called the game yield register. And in this register, you can find out how many deer and pheasants, et cetera, that were shot in a given year or month <clears throat> in all the regions of Denmark. Now, the reason why I, uh, Took this example with is that the first version that we got was anonymous but then in the next version all of a sudden a personal identification number of the hunter was added so we went from something that was completely uncontroversial at least seen from a data protection um, perspective and to something that could be highly controversial because you went from just a database of uh, how many deer were shot to an, a database where you could identify people who have a shotgun and how much they have shot. And <clears throat> obviously that's a big red, red flag for us uh, to see how easily a data set can change from something that is uncontroversial to something that could be sensitive. Um, and of course, when we see something like that, we just take away the personal identification number because it doesn't really reduce the analytical value of the data. So for the administrative data, it's really important for us to start by talking to the user in order to identifying uh, what they actually need so that we don't have to give them the full data set, but only the information that they actually need. Uh, so where we, in survey data might just uh, remove the two black variables that contain sensitive information. We would, in many cases, reverse the process when we're talking about administrative data and only pick out those exact variables, uh, the exact information that the researcher uh, would need in this particular uh, situation. And of course, you can then say, did we anonymize the administrative data? Uh, well, not really, but we certainly disseminated a version of data that does not contain any personal uh, information at all. And therefore, we do not have to talk to the data protection agency, but only the records creator uh, as far as uh, data less than 20 years old uh, go. In all this work, Structured metadata is a friend. Uh, it's really important that you have good metadata for uh, your data sets, uh, both on unit level and data table level, so that you, as an archivist, <clears throat> easily can get uh, insight into what data is about, who provided it, and if it's a sensitive topic or not. And of course, on data table level, find a good description of each variable uh, so that you get a chance to figure out which variables you might have to um, remove in order to make your data set anonymized. Yeah, uh, and this is obviously again where the, um, where the connection to the records creator come into play at the time of ingest, because if you get good structured metadata at the time of ingest, it makes it easier for you to work with data in the rest of the process. And that is certainly also true when it comes to anonymizing data. All right, so I'm about to wrap up and uh, I'm just gonna give you a few pieces of advice 
it's based on our experiences with working with anonymization. And the first piece of advice is, of course, as I just mentioned, to try to get as adequate and complete metadata from the donor at the time of submission. And when you do that, keep the need for anonymization in mind. Where can we find personal information in your data set? What variables could be sensitive? And obviously, the better the metadata you get, the better are your possibilities to understand data and pick out the relevant variables. <clears throat> the next uh, piece of advice would be to always remember to pay close attention to metadata before anonym anonymizing. I mean, you need to get to know the data before de determining how to proceed. And that could be some of the, um, some of the things regarding job title, et cetera, to look at data and see what, what kind of information is actually there. The third one is to not trust your memory. And you must remember that data sets can change from one submission to the next. And this is, of course, based on what we experienced with the game yield register, where something completely uncontroversial uh, changed to something uh, a lot more sensitive just by adding a uh, personal registration number. And that happened from one submission to the next. Also, I think it's important that you know your legislation. Uh, I have talked from a perspective where we work with the Archives Act and the GDPR, but do you know what legislation pertains to your work is really important. Fifth, two are stronger than one is something that we often say, and it really is also the case when we talk about anonymization. So if at all possible, it would be great to have two archivists look at the data before determining how to anonymize. And then finally, at least in our experience, it's a good idea to save the anonymized data sets because they often come in handy afterwards, especially with more uh, popular data sets. And that concludes uh, my presentation. And I think we probably have a few minutes for questions, Mayana, before moving on or? Uh, yes, uh, in our preliminary program, we announced a break right now, but I think we can skip this break and use this time for Q&A session. And uh, then we can continue with uh, Vedran's presentation and then we have then we, for uh, the uh, Vedran's first presentation and then we can can have a break and continue. Um, so yeah, there, there was a lot of questions uh, in uh, chat. So I was trying to follow uh, which were answered and uh, which might need uh, more uh, explanation. Uh, so there was a questions about, um, about this requesting permission from donors. So uh, one question was, what happens if the donor leaves uh, academia or dies or similar? Can they provide a blanket approval for all requests when they donate? Uh, and uh, as I figure out from Matt's answers, uh, the, the, uh, the, this uh, approval is always needed, but maybe you can uh, comment more on this. Uh, yes, I can. Um, yes, uh, we 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 do need to uh, get an approval from the donor each time. Uh, each time uh, there is a request. Mm -hmm. uh, so, so what? Uh, and then, what happens when the donor leaves academia, or dies, or similar, which are probably uh, different things? When? Yeah. Well, in. In worst case scenario, they are locked for for twenty years. Uh, but uh, uh -huh. oftentimes, uh, in our system, it's uh, the 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 researchers uh, connected to the the institution. So um, it might fall to the institution to um, give the mm -hmm. the uh, access. So institutions has the right to uh, to give this permission. And this is probably on some contractual basis between researcher and institution, or is it, uh, what's the basis for the institution uh, to, 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 to have a right to give this permission? 
what's the what's the law in uh, in in your country about intellectual property mm. well it's an interesting question because uh, yeah <laughs> there is uh, many as aspects of it but uh, but it is um in we uh, we uh, regard the uh, in Denmark, um, universities as public institutions, thereby they are under the Archival uh, Act, and that's why we are collecting it, uh, the data. So, so it's the in institutions, the the universities, we that had they have the uh, the right responsibility uh, in in the end uh, too. Mm -hmm. And and there so there is no possibility for a donor to provide a, a blanket approval for all requests. So each request has to be approved, or how? Well, how well there, there is a, there is a one solution to that problem, because uh, otherwise it is uh, each time there is a request we have to ask. Uh, but uh, we actually can uh, can ask as as an archive we can ask the. Um, the donor, if 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 we are allowed to um, to um, provide an mm -hmm. a, a downloadable version on our website, so then it's it's us as as uh, as archive who is the user who's uh, asking for permission to use the data in this way. Uh, so that's the only way uh, to come around that uh, issue. Mm. Um, until until the twenty years yeah, have passed, I'm, after twenty mm -hmm. years, we can we can more freely work with data. Yeah. yeah. That's great. And uh, there was uh, one more question about, uh, so, so the question was, so no donor permission is needed if data have been anonymized. Uh, so I'm not sure if I'm clear with the answer. So, so, so the donor me. permission is needed in any case, even if the data is anonymized. Is yeah, that the first the 20 answer? years, yes. Mm -hmm. Okay, uh, and there were some questions uh, about uh, combination of uh, variables which can uh, identify uh, persons, but I think we will go more into the, this in, in the second part. Mm. Uh, so there are a few new questions in the chat, as I can see. Uh, so one question is, do you use a specific metadata standard? for your data sets? I suppose it's TDI? Uh, no, actually, uh, not anymore. Uh, yeah, mm -hmm. what is it called again? Um, just... Yeah, and uh, okay, while you are searching. So another question is, uh, or comment is, so you prefer to receive the complete data set and to do the anonymization yourself rather than the donor do the anonymization? Yes, yes. That's uh, yes. We, uh, yeah, we, we would like the, the full data uh, mm -hmm. uh, because yeah, actually um, it's the only way for the donor to, um, to um, keep the, the set uh, data uh, they are not allowed to keep it themselves uh, if, if if it contains uh, sensible data they have to uh, uh, <clears throat> they have to uh, uh, get rid of it uh, uh, but but they have the uh, the the possibility to uh, to uh, hand it over to us and then we will take care care of it of it and mm -hmm. uh, in a, in a safe way. Uh, and then, of course, uh, we do the anonymization if necessary. So the next question from, from, from the chat is, does DNA negotiate with data access committees if the donor is unreachable? Data access committee. Um, so uh, I would like to invite participants to ask questions also uh, by voice, if you want. Uh, so, Diba, if, if, if you can uh, clarify, um, you can do this in chat, of course, this question about data access committees. Well, given uh, how blank both Mass and High yeah, look, well, we, I sure. think the answer is no. 
<laughs> <laughs> okay, it was maybe also a cheating question. Um, it's um, in 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 many other countries. Um, there's a thing uh, growing in the, at the universities called data access committees. That is especially, um, it's not the only uh, obligation, but one of the obligations is to uh, act as a gate uh, for such questions as can we use, can a, an archive use this or that uh, data set? Um, because it is the uh, very common situation that a researcher uh, leaves uh, the 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 uh, institution uh, in question so um, the the very logical response to that is to to establish a data access committee that among other things can uh, clarify such questions and we're actually uh, uh, in the process of, of getting such ac access committees in the Danish universities too and the STU has one and AU is uh, also embarking on that and uh, maybe other, also other Danish universities. So, um, but now um, if you're completely blank, then you are not as blank anymore. <laughs> <laughs> thank you. Thank you so much. Sounds like we will have to take a chat with them uh, sometime. Yeah. Bye bye. Yeah. Okay. Thank you. And we have a one uh, hand raised. So, Kian. I probably butchered your name. You can unmute yourself and you can ask question if you want. Yeah, thanks. Uh, this is Jen. Hi. I have a question about... Uh, so you oh, we cannot hear you. Oh, um... Unfortunately, we... Uh... Unfortunately... Oh, oh, yeah, great. Yeah, we can hear you now. Okay, thanks. Um, um, I have a question about um, uh, getting permission. So you said you will ask the donor to, to get donor's permission, but I was wondering whether you also need to get permission from the data subject, because according to GDPR, I think you the, the data subject only give you permission for a very specific purpose of their uh, of pro for processing their data. And for another uh, purpose, I think you need to re-consent or to get permission again. How, how do you deal with that? Hmm. Well, as, uh, as I said, I, I'm, I'm no expert on, on GDPR, but what we need to make sure is that we have a legal basis for the processing. And there are some... <clears throat> There are some formulations, some some paragraphs in GDPR that makes it possible for at least for us as a national archive to use data for, uh, for instance, scientific purposes or archival purposes in the in the public interest that um, makes it possible for us to use data without having to ask uh, the data subjects. But you're right. And again, that's why I stressed so much that it's important that everybody knows their legislation because who knows in what cases you might have to, to ask the data subject. But for us as a National Archive, uh, with data that have been submitted to us according to the Archives Act, uh, we do not have to do that. Okay. So do we have uh, more questions? We are running out of time slightly but not so much. So if you have something else to ask, you can. If not, uh, then I would like to invite uh, Vedran to share his screen and to start his presentation about basic concepts of anonymization. Uh, sorry, can you see the slides and hear me okay? Yes. Oh, great. Okay. So, hi, and welcome to the second session, which is called The Basic Concepts of uh, Anonymization. As uh, Mariana said, my name is Vedra Halamic, and I work as a research assistant at the Creation Social Science uh, Data Archive. So, to introduce myself, basically, 
a big part of my job is uh, ensuring that the data we archive is anonymized so it can be shared uh, safely. Uh, I would like, oh, oh, I don't need to point out that the workshop is being uh, recorded. So uh, before I start, I would like to point out that the uh, anonymization is certainly a complex and, and, and a difficult topic, uh, not because it requires some difficult to, 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 to acquire skills, but because there is simply no one solution that uh, fits all problems. And you really have to solve each problem case by case or data set by, by data set. And uh, here at Crosda, Mariana and I often have uh, lengthy discussions about how to handle some problem. We often consult other researchers uh, also. So uh, the goal of this workshop is not to show you the recipe on how to handle anonymization, but uh, to show you the tools uh, you need to teach the fundamentals and to point out the important problems you're going to need to, to, to discuss with your colleagues and fellow researchers to assure that uh, the data you are sharing is uh, to say as safe as possible for the for the study participants and as useful as possible for, for, for the researchers. Okay, so to start, I will lay out the planned schedule, which is to first go over some basic terminology and the logic of uh, anonymization. After that, I will try to explain the concepts of uh, k-anonymity and data environment. And after that, I will quickly go over just the installation of the SDC micro, the basics of the application's graphical uh, interface, and the last part will be devoted to working with the ap application, of course, and a Q&A session afterwards. So uh, I'll start with a brief overview of some theoretical concepts uh, con concerning anonymization. Here, I would like to refer you to, to Mark Elliott's book, The, the Anonymization Decision-Making Framework, the Euro European Practitioner's Guide, which is op openly available at the link. If Mariana can please uh, link, put the link into the chat. And I will refer to that book many, many times today. And I think this framework is, is a really good place to start learning about anonymization. Uh, Elliot's framework starts with the basic idea that uh, anonymization is not just a single process that is done at one point in time, but instead it, it outl outlines three key aspects uh, to making decisions on how to anonymize. And the first of this is the data situation audit, which specifically considers uh, where do you want to archive? How do you want to present your data? What is your role or responsibility with the data? And what are the spe specifics of, of, of the data? Uh, for instance, this concerns what kind of variables are collected, uh, where are they stored, uh, who will have access to that data, uh, that sort of uh, thing. So the stage after that is to do a risk analysis or uh, to, to determine what are the actual chances that there will be a disclosure. And the final stage is then to do an so-called impact management, uh, which is basically, uh, if there's a disclosure, what, is, what are your plans for that incident? And a couple of key points about this uh, framework, it uh, comprehensively points out that analyzing the risk of disclosure should be something that is iterative, not linear. There is uh, basically no single point where uh, this should be done or assessed, but rather you should think about all of the places that data are stored or presented. Uh, the risk of publishing with data extracts should also be considered uh, along with the risks uh, for sharing that data with colleagues across institutions or uh, just storing that data on a computer. And the other point I want to emphasize is that it's not possible to fully anonymize data, at least not in a way that uh, would make that data useful for others. So 
And that's the story of the, the, the delicate uh, balance between data usability and uh, anonymization, which I'll talk more about later. I think uh, Yanni also mentioned it. So basically, fully anonymizing would mean that even the participant uh, themselves looking at the data would not be able to identify to identify their own answers and uh, stripping the, the data to this point ruins it for for further analysis so so to try to define anonymization basically it, it is a complex process uh, to transform identifiable data into non-identifiable data which is not really helpful on its own but uh, it also says that this usually requires that identifiers be removed obscured aggregated and or altered in some way and it also may involve restrictions on the data environment which i will talk more about later so <clears throat> Personal data can be disclosed through two categories of uh, identifiers. The first is, uh, of course, the direct identifiers, which is the information that is sufficient on its own to identify an individual. This can be a person's full name, social security number, or even a, an email containing the personal, personal name. Indirect identifiers are the kind of information that are that on their own are not enough to identify someone but when linked with other available available information could be used to do to to uh, identify a person so the important point i'm trying to make is that uh, rare combinations can sort of crop up and create a risk of someone sp spontaneously uh, re-identifying uh, individuals so and also it's not always easy to differentiate uh, if a variable is a direct or an indirect identifier. So a useful link uh, is, is, is the SESDAM data management expert guide, which uh, also contains many other useful recommendations. But if you scroll down and you click on the plus by the anonymization methods in uh, uh, Finland, you will see what, what is basically a big table that classifies a lot of the commonly used variables into three groups, direct and indirect, but also a third category, which is the strong indirect identifiers. So these are variables that can be considered both direct and indirect at the same time, and but they contain information that can, that can be used to identify an, an individual fairly easily. So that includes information like like a phone number an email address uh, a rare occupation unusual job title or uh, some kind of code uh, that can identify individual from among a group uh, like a student id and just to point out they are, they're also very often uh, removed so they're often treated as a as they are, uh, as they were a uh, direct uh, identifier. Okay. So, uh, Elliot also mentions uh, and describes four uses of the term anonymization. And the first one is, is the absolute or, or full anonymization, which essentially means zero risk for any identification under any circumstances. This, as I said, this basically means you have data which is itself of no use. And the next one is formal anonymization, which uh, means stripping away direct identifiers or replacing them with pseudonyms. And this is often not, not sufficient because there is a possibility that within the data, there are indirect identifiers which can enable someone who wishes to 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 to, to re-identify by using those rare combinations uh, the third one is the statistical anonymization which attempts to measure the risk of identification happening and and to control that risk it is sort of a middle ground between two extremes of absolute and and formal and 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 it basically allows the possibility 
that a reidentification could occur, but it tries to measure the risk of it. So we are not in it, we are not insisting that our data are absolutely anonymized, but we are trying to do something in terms of reducing the risk. Now, the disadvantage of, of statistical anonymization is it tends to be very focused on, on the properties of, of the data itself. And the fourth category is, is, is functional anonymization. And that is basically what we are trying to accomplish uh, here at CROSDA. So functional anonymization acknowledges the value of the statistical approach, but also takes into account the environment in which the data exists. So it is considered sort of a holistic approach to anonymization with the assertion that anonymization is but what, what is called data situations. These data situations arise from the data interacting with data environments, which, which I will descri describe a bit later. So although I presented functional anonymization as a separate type, it does in fact overlap with other uh, types of anonymization and specifically, it requires uh, a, the technical know-how that characterizes statistical anonymization. And personally, I think the most important concept uh, here uh, is the concept of k-anonymity, because it makes a lot easier, uh, easier to understand the logic of uh, singling out a participant. And k-anonymity uh, will often be safe enough under certain uh, under certain uh, circumstances so the concept of uh, k anonymity was uh, first in introduced by by professors uh, sweeney and samarati Professor Sweeney is also credited with the popular observation that 87% that, that, uh, of the US population is uniquely identified just by date of birth, uh, gender, and postal code. And the point of that, that research and similar is that released information often contains other data, such as, such as birth date, gender, zip code, that in combination can be linked to, to, to publicly available information to re-identify individuals. So just as a good example of uh, how easy it can be to single out a person, we can go to, uh, to an interesting site of the computational privacy group where you can basically enter a few demographical uh, information and find out the possibility that if a record were to be found in any anonymous uh, data set that matches your attributes, uh, the chance of uh, that, that that data actually uh, belongs to you. Uh, so Croatia is not, is not, uh, Croatian data is not in here. So I'll just choose Austria. Uh, I'll go with Tirol. Uh, okay, what is your birth date? I will select something like this gender okay male uh, marital status uh, has attained education and okay so just by entering these six variables uh, i can <laughs> the the likelihood of being correctly re-identified is 100 percent so that's just to, 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 to show you how easy it is to, to single out an, uh, a participant from, from a data set. Okay. Uh, so, K anonymity techniques um, aim to, to, to prevent the data subject from being singled out by grouping them with at least K individuals. Uh, and to achieve this, the attribute values are generalized to an extent uh, that such it, that each individual shares the same value. For example, um, we can lower the granularity of a location from a city to a county, which we'll do later. So, so a higher number of data subjects are included in the group. 
individual the dates of birth can be generalized into a range of dates uh, or grouped by month or year. And by doing this, we basically prevent the ability to single out an individual because the same attributes are, are shared by, by K users. And the main flaw of, of, of K anonymity model is that it does not prevent any type of inference attack. Indeed, uh, if all K individuals are within the same group, then if it is known which group the individual belongs to, it is trivial to retrieve the value, the value of the property. And if you look at, at, at the table of this uh, on this slide, uh, we can see an example of a poorly done K anonymization. If the attacker knows that a specific individu individual is in the data set and was born in, the, in 1964, he also knows that, that that individual had a heart attack. Furthermore, if we know that the, this data set was obtained from the French organization, then each individual resides in Paris because the first three digits of, 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 of Paris postcodes are 750. So uh, this example, just to, 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 to clarify, was taken from the EU opinion on anonymization techniques, and it uh, contains descriptions of many other uh, anonymization techniques. So uh, if you're interested in that, uh, this is a very, very useful link. Okay, so what are common mistakes uh, with, uh, with uh, K anonymity? The first one is missing some indirect identifiers. Reducing the number of uh, indirect identifiers makes it easier to build clusters of K users due to the inherent power of uh, identification associated to the other attributes, especially if uh, some of them are sensitive. And basically the mistake is to not consider all possible indirect identifiers when selecting the attribute to generalize. And if some attributes can be used to single out an individual in the cluster of K, then the generalization fails to protect, to protect some uh, individuals. And the next, the next uh, common mistake is, is, a, is a choosing a small value of K. So aiming, uh, aiming for, a, for, a, for a small value of K is, is problematic. Is, if K is too small, basically the, the weight of, of any individual in a cluster is too significant and inference attacks have a higher, higher success rate. For instance, if K equals two, then the probability for the two individuals to share the same property is, is higher than for uh, K that equals 10, for example. And another problem related to, 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 to K anonymity uh, that I think uh, needs mentioning is, is uh, uh, our service done on small, small populations like student groups. Um, for instance, a professor conducts a survey on his students and it is not unreal to assume that most of the students, especially if it, uh, if it, uh, it is a small group, can identify their colleagues just by a combination of, of, of few variables. Of course, there are other examples of the same problem like uh, workplace service, uh, sport clubs, or any organizations where, uh, where members know each other well. And in such cases, a researcher has to be aware of the higher re-identification uh, uh, risk. So K-anonymity is, is, is relatively easy to, to, to understand and to implement. There are, uh, well, a few open software tools that can uh, semi-automate the process. However, um, its simplicity can be uh, a bit of deceiving and the user should be aware that there is no method inherent to the, to the K anonymity model for identifying either the, the, the correct level of K or the combinations of the variables that should be considered. Both of this uh, require an understanding of the, 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 the data environment and, and data set uh, properties. And 
as I've said, K anonymity does not prevent all possible attacks. So uh, to deal with that uh, and other problems, L diversity and T closeness have been uh, introduced. I won't, won't go into much detail, but L diversity imposes a constraint when where each group of data uh, units sharing the same attributes attributes must have multiple values on any variable that is defined as as a sensitive and t closeness uh, further extends uh, the l diversity model by stating that the distribution sensitive variables within uh, each uh, uh, similar class should be no further than the threshold D from the distribution across the whole data set. Okay. So at this point, it would be reasonable to say that we have moved some distance away from the uh, simpler uh, idea of k anonymity and even if you are using a software package that that uh, that will do the heavy lifting uh, for you you are still going to need to understand what kl and t actually mean for your data and how this relates to what the intruder might be able to do the risk is uh, here is that you you're making arbitrary decisions led, led by privacy model Rather than, rather than the uh, data situation. So here, it's not to be averse to the, to the use of privacy models. But if, if they are used carefully with, with full awareness of the meaning of the data, uh, K-anonymity and its companion concepts can be uh, very useful tools in some data situations at least. But however, they are not magical uh, and being, they're not magical being neither uh, necessary uh, or sufficient. So to get to the, to the uh, data environment, uh, data environment can be best understood as, as, as a context for an item of data. And it basically answers the, the, the questions like who has access to the data, what analysis may or may not be conducted, uh, what, where is the data uh, uh, analysis going to be carried out? How is access obtained? And answering these questions will probably give, give you a good guideline on how to share that particular, particular uh, data. And to classify, uh, data environment has four core features. So the first one is, is other data, which is any information that can be linked to the data in question. And there are four types of, of uh, other data. The first one is personal knowledge, publicly available sources, uh, restricted data sources, and, and, and other similar uh, data releases. Second one is uh, agents, which are people and entities uh, capable of acting on the data and interacting with it uh, along uh, basically any point in the in the uh, data flow flow. Uh, the third one are governance processes which constrain how agents uh, 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 agents relation relationships with the data are are, are managed. They are usually managed by, by uh, data access control, but also include uh, licensing arrangements and policies which prescribe interaction and behavior of, uh, with the data. And uh, the, last, the last core feature is the infrastructure, which denotes uh, the structures and uh, facilities that allow, that allow the data to, to, to flow. It includes uh, hardware, software, and, and, and physical uh, security. So basically, when, when, when we are anonymizing a data set, we have to think about all of those core features. So, I would like to also point out that while uh, GDPR does not 
explicitly address the issue of data environments or, or the data context, it does specify that appropriate technical and organ organizational measures are, are required to, to ensure uh, appropriate, uh, appropriate uh, security. And environment-based ba solutions for, for, for uh, anonymization essentially control that data users' interactions with the data in some way to reduce the, the, the degrees of freedom of one or more, usually all, all four uh, elements of the, of the uh, data environment. And the key point is to remember that one cannot or cannot, should not make uh, a judgment about whether data are anonymized or not, or, or not without reference to, to their environment. The implication of this is that by the operation of uh, environmental controls, one can anonymize, anonymize the data just as effectively as through controls on the data uh, themselves. And besides data environment, uh, it is uh, important to think about the properties uh, of, uh, of, a, of a data set. So a, a guide to help you uh, think about which data properties uh, require particular, particular attention. Uh, first one is, is uh, data quality, because a small lever, level of error inherent uh, in all data has actually some advantages to it uh, as it offers a, a degree of natural, so to say, data protection. Uh, the second one is uh, age of data. And basically, the older the data, the harder it is to, to identify people correctly. The third one is... Uh, Third, the data set property is, is uh, hierarchical data, which is uh, considered the riskier because they provide more information that might, uh, that might make a data subject unique in a data set. A, a good example here, here would be the combination of, of age and, and, and gender of all members of a household will be unique for most household above a relatively modest size. And for the for the data set property uh, you should think about is is uh, concerning a longitude longitudinal data because uh, that kind of data can uh, capture possibly unique changes in information uh, over time. And just to give you sort of a reminder, the uh, UK anonymization network link, which should be in the chat, uh, contains uh, the templates uh, for, for a data situation and features evaluation and also well, more useful stuff. Uh, we don't have time for, but I definitely uh, recommend it. For instance, you can find the the, the template to evaluate the data situation or data features, which you, 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 you don't have to go through it letter by letter, but it, it will be a, a useful reminder to not, to not skip or, or forget something. Okay. So, so the next one is, is the next part of the session will be SDC Micro. So uh, what is SDC Micro? Just to go for a second, then we'll take a break and continue on. So SDC Micro is, is a open source R package, uh, which uh, if you don't like coding, uh, that doesn't matter because uh, SDC Micro includes a uh, graphical user interface. So uh, if, if you want to use it, basically you would need to literally write two lines of code. And it's, it's, a, it's a package used for, for anonymizing uh, data. 
and it includes various risk estimation methods. It, it includes uh, various anonymization uh, techniques. Uh, I have linked. Uh, it also has a. It's very very well documented. Uh, uh, you have the separate guides for the package itself, and 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 a separate guide for the graph graphical uh, interface. So okay, I'll I'll uh, stop here. We're going to do a quick 10 minute break and then we'll continue with the SDC micro. Second part, the second session uh, is dedicated to working with uh, SDC micro. And uh, to start to using SDC micro, you are going to, of course, need R because it is an R package. And you can download are uh, from this link. I think uh, Mariana will put it in the chat. Also, you, you basically go to download R, you choose the mirror that's uh, nearest to you. And uh, the R is really greatly uh, documented. So I don't think there, there should be any problems uh, with, with in, installing uh, R. And to make things easier in, in our suggestion is, is uh, to use an IDE or an integrated development environment, which is also true basically for every other programming uh, language. So IDE is, is an application designed to help user uh, to be more productive. Uh, probably the most popular IDEs for our, our, uh, our studio which uh, will also be linked. Uh, uh, besides our studio, uh, Jupyter Notebooks and Visual Studio Code Eclipse are also some of the popular alternatives. And there is no clear answer which ID you should use. Uh, people just, you just need to find the one that works best for you. And there are really a lot of, a lot of uh, possible <laughs> Uh, choices and as I mentioned, I will use uh, our studio today, and it is a fairly simple uh, application. It consists of, uh, by default at least, uh, of four different panes. Uh, first is the script editor, where we write our uh, code uh, as a script, uh, workspace, and and and. Uh, history, uh, there is the R console, and of course, this part is uh, dedicated to plots, files, and help. Also, this is where you can uh, install packages. And uh, just to mention, uh, our studio is very customizable, so all of this can be uh, changed and rearranged in, in a way that uh, best uh, suits you. So. Normally, or usually, after you installed R and IDE of your choice, usually you would uh, need the op to open uh, the IDE and uh, uh, enter the line install.packages uh, SDC micro, add this uh, dependencies uh, equals uh, true to install all the packages uh, needed for, for SDC micro. But uh, currently, uh, there is there is a sorry uh, someone is unmuted can you yeah it's fine now okay so uh, the problem is there is uh, there is currently a problem with the installation uh, because as you see micro has been uh, removed from 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 cran and you're going to need uh, to download the package uh, manually either from CRAN or, or uh, GitHub, and then manually install it. Uh, hopefully, this will be resolved quickly, so new users can, can install uh, the default way. But uh, basically, you go uh, to the CRAN, uh, to the CRAN uh, page, look for SDC Micro. It will say, say that uh, it, it was removed. But you can click Archive, choose the latest version, and then in, in the IDE, go to packages, install, choose, uh, choose package, archive file, uh, click uh, browse and find the file and just install it to, to, to library. 
Okay. Uh, sorry, Vedran, uh, I'm not sure for others, but can you can you uh, make your screen a bit bigger? At least for me, it's very uh, small uh, letters. It's control know. plus or or maybe you will do this later when you okay. come to doing. Oh, yeah. It's, it's Better. Okay. Yeah. Mm -hmm. okay. So uh, after uh, after installation, uh, you're you're going to need to load the library uh, just by entering library uh, SDC uh, micro in the console, which will load load the the, the package and then uh, just write SDC app and it should open it in your system's default web browser. Uh, so SDC Micro uh, GUI opens uh, in your web browser, it's through the local host, and it works with the recent versions of any web browser, although it is recommended uh, to use the, 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 the Google Chrome, Mozilla Firefox, or uh, Safari post for uh, best performance. In case your default browser is not of the aforementioned ones, uh, you can simply open an, an alternative uh, browser and uh, copy the link in the in the address bar. Also, uh, this uses a uh, local host, uh, which is not connected to the internet. Uh, so an internet connection is not required while uh, using SDC micro and SDC app. And also the data are, are all stored locally on your, on your computer. So the SDC app uh, consists of uh, seven uh, different tabs you can see. I hope at least uh, over here, and um, all of them are, are practically uh, different parts of the of the statistical disclosure process. Uh, the tabs, as I've said, can be selected uh, here in the navigation bar, uh, and this navigation bar will stay visible at 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 all uh, times. So uh, to start. Uh, I will load the dat data set I have prepared for the exercise. So I uh, click on micro data and basically- can you, can you can you please make it a bit bigger? Better? I'm not, I'm not sure for others because I'm on a lousy screen, but it's better is bigger probably for everybody as long as everything fits on the screen. Okay, yeah. so I- Now, somebody said. Okay, uh, so I clicked on the microdata tab and on the left sidebar, I need to choose uh, uh, the, the format that uh, corresponds to the data set I'm trying to, to, to load. Uh, SDC uh, supports R data, SPSS is a subfile, Stata, and uh, SAS, and of course, uh, CSV, which is what I'm going to be using. So I'll click on that. Uh, there are some options like convert string variables to factor. Does the first con row contain the variable names? Do we need to drop variables with only missing values? And of course, choose the, the, the field separator. So the default options are OK with me and I just browse and find the data set. So just to get familiar with the SDC micro uh, interface on the uh, about help tab, uh, here you can uh, set the uh, storage path, uh, stop or restart the, the interface. And it also includes contact and, 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 and feedback if, if you want to suggest something or report a bug. And the second one is, is the uh, microdata tab where you can load, uh, uh, explore, view uh, the microdata you are going to anonymize. And the anonymous tab uh, will will uh, be used to set up the the, the anonymization uh, problem. The risk utility, which we can see uh, right now, is used to evaluate disclosure risk and data utility uh, for the uh, data set. 
And uh, the next uh, tab is to export the anonymized data and, and uh, also the reproducibility tab where, where you can browse and download the script to use to generate uh, your results. As it says, uh, this can be, uh, this can be uh, uh, used later as a reminder of what you did or entered into, into R from uh, the command line or from the GUI. And uh, the last page uh, is, 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 is uh, the undo tab. And here you can revert one or several steps in the anonymization uh, process. So before, uh, before we set the anonymization uh, problem, a good practice is, is to explore the, the data. Uh, so I'll click on, on microdata and here we can display the variables and search, it, search uh, if we need. But, uh, uh, but also we can choose how many entries, of course, to, to, to be shown. I'll just select all and I can scroll down to, to, to look at the uh, data. Uh, the explore variables uh, allows us uh, to see tabulation summary statistics. Now, as I've zoomed in, it's uh, a little big, but you can even uh, combine two variables together and it will show the, the uh, scatter plot. The uh, reset variables, uh, basically you can reset, here you can reset the variable to its original state and cancel any, any modification you did. Uh, you can use only a subset of, of microdata. Uh, this can be useful when you're trying to for instance, anonymize a subset of data uh, for open source, but keep some of the data in, in restricted uh, access. You can also, here you can also convert uh, variables uh, under modify uh, uh, factor variable. You can group or combine the factor levels uh, of categorical variables before setting up uh, the anonymization problem. We will do that later during the anonymized step. And next you can generate a stratification uh, variable by chaining together values of two or more uh, variables. Uh, this is particularly uh, useful if you need to apply methods within strata or uh, the, if you need to just, uh, 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 you, you can generate basically a certification variable by, by chaining together two or more. So uh, also one useful thing the, the SDC micro provides is because it is an R package, uh, SDC can only interpret uh, missing values that are coding, that are coded as NA. Uh, and you, you can basically hear, uh, choose, I don't know, the loaded, the loaded data set may contain different missing values, codes such as 9, 999. And here you can set, set individual cells to NA, which will be recognized by R and SDC uh, by selecting the, the variable and the record uh, ID. Okay, and... Uh, so I just so I don't skip. The last is the uh, hierarchical data tab in case uh, where our data has a hierarchical uh, structure. The anonymization process here uh, basically consists of uh, two steps. The anonymization of uh, the higher level record and variables and the anonymization of the complete file with the anonymized higher level uh, merged into. And here you can create a, a, a household level for step one and merge the anonymized file into the full data set uh, for step two. So to start the anonymization in, in SDC micro, we need to first define uh, a problem. So I will click on the anonymized tab and here you can select the variables and set parameters for the uh, anonymization. Uh, 
uh, this page will also, or tab will uh, also show you later the summary of the anonymization problem. And you can apply the anonymization methods here. So in this data set, we have a, a list of variables uh, email, sex, age, uh, city, income, and some uh, random uh, scale. And basically, we need to choose key variables here. A key variable is a uh, variable we, we, we think could be common to two or more uh, data set, which may therefore be, be used for a record uh, linkage between them. Or uh, more generally, a key variable is a variable likely to be accessible to the data intruder. And uh, these are the variables we want to suppress to lower the, the risk of uh, identification. And uh, this de data set uh, I uh, loaded is completely made up just for this uh, exercise, but it's uh, made up in a way that it resembles uh, a small survey conducted on, on, on students, which is something we, let's say, often see, see at our archive. And it basically contains email addresses, uh, age, city, income, and, and uh, the random scale, which depending on the subject could be sensitive or not. Now, because a survey like this uh, would be probably conducted at our university, access will uh, probably be restricted and not open. And the reason for that is uh, there is a high probability that a student can identify at least some of their colleagues by, by a combination of, of the few mentioned uh, variables. And if the mentioned scale uh, contains sensitive information, that information can easily then be linked. So uh, as I've said before, if we are dealing uh, with the data set that contains direct identifiers or a strong indirect uh, identifiers, those variables uh, should probably most likely need to be uh, deleted. So the ba most basic, if we can even, even call it, uh, technique of anonymization is to simply delete the variable that contains participants, uh, name, address, telephone number, or maybe an email address that uh, contains participant's name. And uh, SDC Micro makes this pretty uh, easy to delete. So under the anonymous tab, we just click this checkbox that says uh, delete. Uh, and the reason is, 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 is why we want to delete the e email uh, variable because it can be easily used for uh, re-identification. And personally, I don't see any analytical value in keeping it. Okay, so the next variable is uh, sex, which is of course a, a categorical variable. So let's just click that. Age, we can click on continuous. City is once again categorical and income in euros is uh, continuous. Now, other variables uh, in this data set says are uh, scales and those aren't key variables. So I'll just leave them as a no and Oh, just before I uh, click the, the setup problem, just a second, there are additional parameters that uh, SDC Micro uh, allows us to use. And the first is uh, alpha, which is used to compute the frequencies of keys, which is then used to compute uh, risk measures for categorical uh, key variables. And it is uh, the weight with with which a key that coincides based on a missing value contributes to these uh, frequencies. Uh, we don't have any missing values in this data set, so I'll, I'll just uh, leave this on one by default. And the parameter uh, seed is used to initialize, uh, initialize the random number generator, which is used for some probabilistic uh, methods. Also, we can if we need to take a 
quick, quick look at uh, some variable, we can do this here. So everything is checked. I click on the setup, the anonymization problem. Okay, so now we can see the summary, we can see the categorical key variables, we can also see the numerical and the deleted ones. We can, we will have some information on the categorical key variables, uh, risk measures, and information on uh, key anonymity. And this is useful because we can see the number of, of observations that are violating the, the key anonymity uh, property. And uh, here, as we do uh, the anonymization steps, there will, there, uh, they will be listed uh, here. Okay. So to move to the first anonymization technique, which is widely used and known, and that is recoding uh, a variable. Uh, recoding is, is a method used to decrease the number of distinct categories or values. And this is done usually by, by, by combining or grouping uh, categories for uh, categorical variables or constructing uh, the intervals for continuous variables. Also, recoding is applied to all observations uh, on a certain variable and not only to those that, uh, that are uh, at risk of disclosure. And uh, SDC app uh, has two general types available. The first is global recoding, and the other one is top and bo bottom, which I'll talk about more uh, later. And in order to perform global uh, reco recoding in the SDC app, we need to navigate to the anonymize tab, select recoding from the uh, from the left sidebar and first we need to select the variable which we want to uh, which we want to uh, recode I'll select a city in this case and uh, also just to mention only a categorical key variables uh, will be shown here so uh, a common practice is to recode the city uh, to a county because we want to protect the participants from being singled out if they live in a small city and uh, or we have only a few participants from a particular uh, city and as we can see uh, on the graph uh, at the bottom these are cities in Croatia and we can see that there are a couple of cities with, which have uh, a small number of, of uh, participants like uh, Kastav or, or uh, Samobor. So if we want to combine those categories, we need to, we need to select the levels. And for instance, uh, Zaprešić and Samobor are part of the uh, Zagrebačka, Zag Zagrebački county. So I'll just write that here. Do we need to add missing values to the new new factor level? No. Zagrevačka recode key variable. And when we look at the graph below, those two cities will be com combined into a county. Next one, we need to get Rijeka into Primorsko Goranska county record that castel novi and split as okay osik is And oh, uh, okay. I just need to add a sol into the split scodal Matinska. Small mistake and recode that. And if you look 
into the summary, we can now see that we, that we have lowered uh, uh, the risk and changed the number of observations that are uh, violating the DK uh, anonymity. Now, the next technique, uh, as I said, is top and bottom coding, which is similar to the global recoding uh, we did, but instead of recoding all the values, only the top or bottom values of the distribution uh, or categories are reco recorded. So this can be applied only to ordinal categorical uh, variables or at least semi-continuous because uh, the values have, a, have to be at least ordered. And top and bottom coding is especially useful if the bulk of the values lies in the in the center of the distribution with with the peripheral categories uh, having only few observations above certain uh, thresholds and those are typically uh, at the tails of the uh, distribution basically the fewer the observations uh, within a category the higher is the identification uh, risk so uh, one solution is basically uh, to group the values at the tails of the distribution into one category. And this reduces, uh, reduces the risk for those observations and importantly uh, does so without much damage to the, to the uh, data utility. So to perform uh, top or bottom coding in SDC, we are again at the anonymized tab. We select uh, top and bottom coding from the left sidebar. And uh, first we need to select the variable to be recorded. I'll select age. And if we look at the uh, plot at uh, the bottom, we can see that most of our participants are of age of 19 to 20 to 25, six, uh, which is usual. Now, if we want to additionally uh, protect the outliers, because we assume that an older student is more, identif more easily identifiable, we can set up a threshold value here. And all values above that will be uh, replaced with a replacement value. I don't know, but um, sometimes it is a different value for replacement, but often it, 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 it is, uh, the same. So I'll set the threshold at 26 and the replacement value will be 27. And we can see the number of values that will be replaced and what percent of the data that is. And of course we can choose top or bottom here. And if we click apply, we can also, we can then see the, the changes uh, in the summary. And also, as I've said, we can here see, uh, see uh, the, the, the steps we have, we have uh, taken. Okay, the next technique I want to show is uh, aggregation. And a good candidate for that would be the, the income uh, variable. Now, if we want to aggregate uh, a variable, the easiest choice uh, would be to basically recode, recode that uh, variable into predetermined ranges and aggregate uh, the data that way. But by doing that, we, we also uh, lose some of the analytical value because for instance, uh, we can uh, calculate the mean after uh, we have categorized a continuous uh, variable. And SDC micro allows us to do something different. And that is to use basically many different algorithms for, for aggregation. So if I go and click on the micro aggregation, uh, basically we will see uh, that first, first we have to choose if we want to use the cluster-based 
uh, method or, or not. And the cluster method first creates a cluster and then applies the micro aggregation within these uh, clusters. Uh, I don't have a lot of experience with, with uh, cluster methods, so I leave that on, on the uh, default. And uh, then we need to select uh, the method and MDAV is, is the default method. Uh, it is based on the Euclidean distance uh, measures. And we can also uh, choose if we want to apply micro aggregation in groups or, or on the whole data set. Uh, unfortunately, when it comes to the methods and algorithms, uh, I don't know enough to give you advice on the, on the best uh, method. But the most important uh, parameter here is the aggregation level, because it specifies how many uh, observations are grouped together before, uh, before replacing the actual values with some kind of aggregate. If we put in the number five, uh, SDC micro will, will, will automatically group five observations together. And Left to right, select income, and then again, choose five, click perform. Uh, we can see under the expert tab, if we look at the data, that we can, we can notice that the nearest values have been grouped in groups of uh, five and their value is changed to their average value. So I know this has happened because uh, the original data had only uh, whole numbers. So SDC basically found the five nearest results, groups of five, and then uh, uh, change their values to, 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 to uh, an average. Okay, uh, so the next thing I, I would like to show is, is uh, how to achieve k-anonymity in, in SDC micro. So if we are not satisfied with the, with the summary and the data is uh, considered sensitive, we may choose also to perform uh, k-anonymization and uh, to do that, we, we, we stay under the Anonymize tab and click on the K Anonymity. And here we can basically uh, suppress or set uh, some values in the selected uh, categorical key, val key variables, the missing values, in order to, to achieve K, K Anonymity. And by default, uh, the key variables will be considered for suppression in the order of their number of distinct uh, categories. So a variable with many categories is less likely to have values suppressed than a variable with, with few uh, categories. You may also decide uh, to apply the procedure uh, uh, for all possible subsets, uh, subsets of key variables. And this is useful if you have many key variables, and uh, this can drastically reduce the computation time. And of course, the most uh, important thing when it comes to k-anonymity is uh, you can set a different value for the parameter k, uh, and you can also do that for each size of the uh, subsets. As I have already mentioned, the problem is there is no simple answer to what uh, number to choose for k. Uh, now, some institutions have their own rules about that, and this will depend on, of course, what is in the data and who will have access to it. To it. And just to show an example, I will choose five, but uh, this is really something that should be uh, discussed on a case-by-case -case, uh, basis. So, okay, there is no stratification. There is no need to modify importance of uh, key variables. So I'll just click on the establish K anonymity. And now if you go to the show summary and we we'll look at the, the information of, of uh, K anonymity, we will see that there are no more 
uh, observations violating it. So if that is what we are going for, this is, this is uh, how to do it. Now, if we want to see what was done to the, to the uh, data, we can go to the export, choose all entries. And when I scroll down all the way down, down I will see that there are two, 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 uh, two, two entities uh, have no, no record of, of the county. Now, that is because in uh, Zagrebačka county, we had only two participants. So in order to achieve the K anonymity, we, they are uh, set as, as, as missing values. Okay, so the next thing I would like to show is the uh, risk utility tab. And when it comes to assessing uh, the risk and, and uh, utility balance, the SDC Micro offers a, a, a variety of measures, but uh, statistical measures of information loss are based on a number of categories, uh, on their mean size uh, in original and modified uh, variables and the size of the smallest uh, category. And they're not based on the analytical value for researchers because it is hard or practically impossible to calculate how much we lost by, for instance, recoding the variable city to a county. In, in this example, uh, there were not many categories uh, recorded, but we lost the ability to estimate the population of the city the participants are coming from. And that can be a big loss in, in, in certain uh, cases and analysis. And another problem with these measures is uh, it's really hard to find what are the desirable values, uh, something like determining the K anonymity. And also, what is a good value will, will, will be determined by the, 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 the state of the data, what is inside, and of course, all those things I have talked uh, about before, who has access, how will the data be used. So under the risk uh, utility tab, uh, we can find information uh, uh, of risk uh, on, on the first tab, and here we can, uh, we can, if we choose the risky observations, this is particularly uh, useful. We can choose the, the, the level of risk and SDC micro will show us the more uh, risky entries. And then we can, uh, we can decide what, what, what to do with them. But uh, the important thing is, is you can set the, the risk metric and it will show you the 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 uh, entries that are violating it. Um, also, here we can uh, uh, just a second. Uh, so here we can uh, we can compute the the L diversity uh, measure uh, if it's needed. We can uh, also check uh, the difference. Uh, between uh, the original and the modified uh, data, either by uh, groups, uh, by, by graphs or uh, tables. So for instance, we can take city and it will show us the original version and the uh, modified. Uh, and that is also available as a table. So, okay. Um, it can, it can also, uh, this can be used to, 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 to uh, check if, we, if there are any more modifications we, 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 uh, we need to, to, to decide on. Okay, so um, under the compare summary statistics, and this is particularly, particularly uh, useful because we can check if the if the uh, modified data what is the correlation between the original and modified we of course want that to be uh, as high as possible and uh, also the uh, standard deviation in the and in the uh, interquartile uh, range so in the case of age 
we can see that that uh, before there was a max uh, of 31 now it's 27 and the mean has only slightly uh, changed so the differences are minimal which is a good thing because if we can keep the participants as uh, safe as reasonably uh, possible and uh, the differences between the original and the anonymous data uh, minimal and uh, in the case of income we can also see that oh, the, the mean hasn't changed but the maximum is and the correlation is 0 0.95 okay so as they see also exports uh, data in several uh, different uh, formats which uh, include if we scroll all the way down uh, which include uh, our data spss uh, subfile again csv stata and uh, sas and in order to uh, export the file uh, we simply choose the format we can choose if we, we need to randomize the order of records and simply uh, save uh, the data set and it will say the pet file at the bottom of the screen. Just to mention, uh, if we choose the CSV file as an uh, export format, we, we will need to, to, to include some additional options like uh, does it have the variable names in the first uh, row field separator decimal separator and uh, that and also uh, just to, 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 to mention for uh, stata files uh, the version of uh, stata needs to be specified because stata cannot use uh, stata files say for uh, for a, a higher version and Oh, uh, just to mention also on the uh, why sometimes it's necessary to randomize order of, uh, of records because order uh, can sometimes really uh, reveal values if they are for instance ordered by a region with suppressed regional uh, value and that would be that thank you mm -hmm.